notre cordine. Okay, so last time we discussed how to compute the capacitor in different geometry. So of course the one that is the most used is this equation, which is for parallel plate capacitor. But I show you how to use integration to do cylindrical capacitor. So that will be a coaxial cable, spherical capacitor. So that could be a vine half generator or uh, the earth here. When uh, then when B becomes really big compared to A, so we have the earth or we have a Van Graaff generator, that equation becomes this equation. Okay, so we have a pop quiz, we will be using that equation here. And this is a constant, and you see it's 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12. Do remember that P stands for pico, pico is 10 to the negative 12. Okay, so we did that. So I told you about Michael Faraday because he's the one who did uh, the first study on dielectric and he used like spherical capacitors. So we did all that. And then the, the last thing I had to cover is the energy stored in a capacitor. So it's going to be one half CV square. And um, it, if, if you plug, if you plug, so if I use, if I just use that equation here, so that will be just for a capacitor, right? And I told you again that when you have a capacitor, it doesn't matter if it's spherical or cylindrical, the energy is actually stored inside the electric field, right? So inside the capacitor here, the electric field is homogeneous. It's uniform. It has the same magnitude and the same direction. And you have to imagine that it's going to be in 3D. So between the plates here, you have a volume. Okay, So it's going to be a width times length times the distance. That's going to be the volume inside the capacitor. And you have energy inside here. So the equation for the energy is 1 half C the capacitance times the voltage across the capacitor. And then if you use the equation C equals Q over V, so the way I remember, I know the capacitance is like depending only on geometry. So it reminds you of capacity. So it means like how much it can contain, like a beaker, right? So it's only depending on the geometry. And the definition of capacitance is how many charges that capacitor can hold for a given one volt voltage, right? So the definition is how many charges per one volt. And if you plug that into here, so you're going to have one half, and then you have Q over V here, and then you have V squared. Um, C equals Q over V. So you have another equation, so one half QV. So that will be another equation. Sometimes it's more convenient to use this one. Or I can get rid of the V. So for example, if you have energy equals one half QV, and you know that using this equation, of course, V equals Q over C, and you plug that into here, then you have one half Q square over C. So that could be also convenient. So you have three equations. Depending on what is given to you, you can use either for the energy stored in a capacitor, okay? And then if we go back to the equation for a plain capacitor, so plain capacitor, you have C equals K, the dielectric constant, epsilon zero, that will be the 8.85, 10 to the negative 12, times the area, 
divided by the distance, okay? And you plug that into here. So you plug that equation into here. What do you get? You get this, one half, that's your C, okay? And remember that for a plane capacitor, you have V equals EG. Okay, so that comes from the equation, you know, V equals minus, and you go from A to B times DL. We've discussed that many times, that the energy that you are storing has to come from somewhere, so something is doing work against the electric field to store the energy into the capacitor, okay? And you are increasing the voltage, so nothing new here. So you plug that V equals ED into here, right? And you get that equation there. Okay, so you have one half K epsilon zero. That will be the area. That will be the distance times E square. And then you have a G square. Okay, so that will be the energy contained in a plane capacitor. That's going to become one half K and you see that I can cross out D here, so epsilon zero, E square, and then you have area times D. And what is area times D? What's the area of a geometric shape times the height? The volume, very good, right? So if you have a prism here, but that was your capacitor, and that will be the area and that will be your D. So actually, that's going to be your volume. So energy, energy, so that's the volume, right? So if I move the volume on the other side, so energy divided by volume equals one half K epsilon zero E square. And this is very, very important when you're going to go to electromagnetism because that's going to be the energy per unit volume, okay? Energy, this is the energy, okay? Uh, I'm, okay, not confused with the electric field, okay? So this is the energy density. So it's the energy stored in a capacitor per unit volume. That's what it says here. And of course, this is very important because it's giving us the equation for the energy stored inside an electric field, you know, so you can find the energy density inside an electric field. So you can use that equation, for example, to find the energy stored in an electromagnetic wave, you know, that any electromagnetic wave has energy inside, for example, if you are exposing someone to gamma rays, you know, all those gamma rays are going to burn their energy into the cells, destroying the cells, and the person could die from radiation sickness. So electromagnetic waves do store energy, and that's how we can find, for example, the energy stored inside the electric field per unit volume. So we... we we did the computation just for a plain capacitor, but it will be true for any capacitor and for any situation when you have an electric field. Is that clear? So I think I'm going to use that for the uh, pop quiz because here it says, see the, the next week pop quiz, it says see textbook 24.8 and 24.9. And that text, um, that problem, so that's what I'm going to use for the pop quiz. I hope people uh, come today. I don't know, do you have a test, an exam, or what's happening? Is that the, it's not the Super Bowl, right? What's happening today? Like no one is here. So if you remember, uh, example, the coaxial cable. Okay, so that will be the equation for coaxial cable. If you, if you go back a bit, I think it was 
slide uh, coaxial cable and then you have all the equation here no it's not coaxial cable coaxial cable is with the ln so it will be a spherical capacitor that will be the equation for it so that will be here the capacitance for a spherical capacitor that 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 is the equation spherical capacitor and if you want to find the energy stored inside so you're going to say it's one half c v square and the question in the textbook is find its energy using that equation and using c equals for example uh, you can you can the the idea is to plug that into here okay and use first you have to use c equals q over v so the question in the textbook is find the energy store in a spherical capacitor and what is given it will be the charge placed inside that capacitor and the size so b and a that's it so they ask you to find the energy store inside given that so you want to try that just the expression so i remind you you have a sphere here in, and then you have another sphere that will be q minus q and you have the electric field here so you have energy store in between by the way it's here you see you have energy store inside here in in between the spheres maybe this one is charged positively this one is charged negatively and they want to find out the energy store inside given the size of the big sphere so its radius and the size of the small sphere okay can you do that you just plug it in plug plug it in so it's just uh, algebraic right so you substitute c for that expression and you substitute v for that expression you plug that in and see what you get and that will be for the next pop quiz i mean you will get the same equation that we just got before so one half q square over c so if you plug that into here you get this okay you have two expressions for the energy and then you plug c into here so what do you get okay don't stare just do you divide by c so remember when we divide by the ratio you multiply by the reciprocal right so see what you get divide by c c is that expression so do it so multiply by the reciprocal so you take that ratio you flip it what you get so you get p minus a 4 pi epsilon 0 a b you know what i think i i forgot to record no and so the energy store will be one half uh, no sorry will be q square b minus a two times four is eight so eight uh, pi epsilon zero a b so for the the pop quiz like i don't see uh, many people 
today, so I hope that they're going to catch up, but I will ask you to use that. Um, oh, by the way, did you, um, did you go to the, to the talk? So the astronomy talk? You didn't? Your, your brother too, he didn't? Huh? Oh. Okay, is that clear? Okay, so definitely for next week, pop quiz. So we were talking about, okay, try to answer this question. I love those questions. Yeah, this, this make great conceptual question. So for people who pay attention in class but are not that good at math, this is ideal, okay? Great question. Okay, so can you not stare, but actually do? So I'm, I'm going to just remind you that the energy is one half C V square. So we want to know which one has the most energy. If you multiply the capacitance by two, so that's that's before. Okay, so you have some before, and then you 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 increase the energy after, and you do that either by playing with the capacitance or the voltage or both. Is that clear? So see what's gonna happen to the energy. If you multiply the capacitance by 2, keep the voltage the same. If you multiply the voltage by 2 and you keep the capacitance the same, or if you take half the capacitance but you take twice the voltage. Do you understand the question? Okay, so do it. And steering doesn't help. That's the kind of problem that you have to... Two. Okay, so first situation, do it, don't stare, do it, do it, do it, do it. Twice the capacitance. So C is multiplied by two, but you keep the same voltage. What's going to happen to the energy? If you multiply C by two, what's going to happen to the energy? It's going to be multiplied by two. Very good. You see how we do it? So multiply by two. Second situation, now we multiply the voltage by 2, but we keep the same capacitance. So what's going to happen here? Because I have a square. So if I multiply the voltage by 2, what's going to happen to the energy? It's going to be multiplied by 4. Very good. Right? You see how it works? 4. And that's a re reasoning. The, the way you are thinking now, it's like... For engineers, right? It's not that just physics, if you don't like physics that much. So capacitor with half the capacitance. So now, capacitance here is divided by 2, but the voltage is multiplied by 2. So what's going to happen? E, it will be divided by 2 because of that, but multiplied by Four. So it's going to be multiplied by two. So the answer is B. Right? So that's how you want to do it. Now, if you think that's hard, what you can do, you can say, okay, so before C equals one farad, V equals one volt. What's going to happen, for example, if I have twice that much, so two farad? And maybe I have twice the voltage, and you compute E after. Okay, so that's another way to do it if you if you don't like algebra that much. Okay. So you you know what I like. I'm gonna find those conceptual questions. So for the pop quiz tomorrow, something on that uh, homework here, not homework but the textbook that I went through. And this, 
Okay, I have my pop quiz. After this class, I go and I do my pop quiz for next week and I get over with it. Some symbol here, capacitor, when you are doing circuit, that will be the symbol for capacitor. It will just have those two lines. In between, you can shove a dielectric and you can charge a capacitor, discharge a capacitor. We have discussed that. That will be a battery symbol. So it has a plus and a minus switch. Okay, so this is very important, especially for the homework. So I have posted the homework for next week and I have also shared some videos with you. Yeah, I, I, uh, I went over the problem in the video so you can use the video. So this is the most important configuration. We talked about that because that was already done in the 18th century. Turns out when you put uh, capacitors in parallel, it has to be in parallel, and it used to be laden jars, and, and they find out that if you do, if you do that, if you put them in parallel, this is this is called parallel configuration, then you're gonna increase the amount of charges that you can store, which means that for the same voltage you're going to increase the capacitance. Okay, so when you have a parallel circuit, you see the first thing to understand is that the voltage will be the same. So I, I like to do it the engineer's ways. That is, I like to do minus will be my ground. That will be the voltage. Voltage is similar to height. And you see that both of them have the same voltage across, right? So in that case, it's going to be 1.5 volt. And you know that uh, C equals Q over V, right? So they both have the same voltage. So V equals Q over C, right? Q over C. But here you see that V1 equals V2 equals V. So in that case, it's 1.5 volt. So they have the same voltage. So this is the same. So the only way to keep that the same is that the ratio here will be the same, but not Q1 and not Q2. So here you're going to have a Q1. And of course, here you have minus Q1. And here you have Q2, and here you have minus Q2. But the thing to understand is that the amount of charges here that you're going to have depends on the capacitance. So, for example, this capacitor here, you, you see the distance is larger, so the capacitance is smaller. I think I have that for the pop quiz. You know, if you multiply distance by two, the capacitance is divided by two, which is the opposite for the area. Uh, what, what did I say? Yeah, if you increase the distance by two, by a factor of two, the capacitance is divided by two. The area is the opposite, right? Of course, if you increase the area, you increase the capacitance. It's a proportional. It's proportional. So anyway, you see that the amount of charge you can collect here, of course, depends on the affinity for the charge. So here you have a small C1, you're going to have a small Q1. Here you have a big C2, then you're going to have a big Q2. So they are not going to have the same charge but they do have the same voltage. Is that clear? You hear me on that? So it makes sense that it's a, something we do in electronics all the time. We like to put something like a part of the circuit, and there is like all those um, POM, Tivner, Tivner POM, and so forth. But in electronics, when, they, when you work on electric circuit, it's good to put everything in a black box. So I'm going to put that on a black box. 
and I'm going to replace it by one single capacitor, okay? So everything happens. I have one capacitor here. I still have my uh, battery here. One uh, that's that will be plus minus 1.5 volts. So I'm asking you here. Everything happens. I can I can replace those by two plates by one capacitor. We call that the equivalent capacitor. What, what do you think is going to be Q here? You have Q1 and Q2, so you can kind of merge them together. They still have the same voltage across. What do you think it's going to be the charge here? Just ask your gut. What's going to be the charge if you put one capacitor and it has to be equivalent to this one? You combine everything together, right? So what's going to be the charge here? Very good. Who said that? Right? Q1 plus Q2. Everything happens like you bring them together. You have a big area and you have some kind of distance between them in between. So you're going to have Q1 plus Q2. And you have the same voltage because everything from from outside, you, you, you want to have the same thing here, okay? So the voltage here is still 1.5 volt. So in electronics, there is this trick that they always do. They take part of your circuit, you replace it by something very simple. Just in that case, you replace it by one capacitor. If you have a bunch of resistors, you're going to replace it by one single one. If you have a bunch of power supply and, and resistors, you replace everything. Okay, I forgot the theorem. If you take electronics, I think it's definite theorem. So anyway, that, that will be another section. So anyway, I can replace it by Q1 plus Q2. That will be the equivalent resistance uh, capacitor. And of course, what do you think C? C equivalent will be C1 plus C2. Okay, because I have two beakers with different capacity. Everything happens. Like I can replace those two beakers by a big one. And the equivalent capacitance will be C1 plus C2. Is that clear? So this is very important, especially for if you are doing circuit and for what's coming next. By putting capacitors in parallel, you increase the capacitance. So that will be my third question for the pop quiz Tuesday. Okay, what's going to happen if you have two capacitors in parallel? Is are you increasing the total capacitance or the decreasing the total capacitance, or are you just keeping the same? You are increasing it. Is that clear? Okay, and then the next thing you want to understand is what happens if you put them in series. So this is called the configuration. That special configuration is capacitors in series. And you do that if you want to... Dec so why, why would you do that in electronics? Well, capacitors, you know, they don't come with all the numbers you can think of. So by putting them in parallel. So let's say you have, a, let's say you have a, like in parallel, right? So let's say, I don't know, you have a 10 microfarad and you have a 20 microfarad. But for your electronic circuit that you are building, it doesn't work. Maybe you want a 30 microfarad and you don't have it in store, okay? You don't have it or sometimes they don't make it, okay? They don't make all the numbers for the capacitance. It will be too expensive. So what you, you do, you put them in parallel and then you will get your 30 that will work with what you are doing. So of course, if you can increase the capacitance, there is a way to decrease the capacitance. So in that case, you will use that configuration which is in series. It's called capacitors in series. Is that clear? So in that case, 
they are not going to have the same voltage. Okay, so the voltage, remember, it's the height. I like to think as height. Okay, so that will be my ground. I start with 1.5 volt. That's a 1.5 volt. Here, I'm going to drop height or voltage. So that will be V1. And then I'm dropping again V2. And V1 and V2 are not the same. In that case, they are. No, they are not the same because here you have C1 and here you have C2, right? So C equals Q over V. So V equals Q over C. So that V1 will be Q over C1 and V2 will be Q over C2. So what do you think the charge is? Look, they are touching. Ask, ask your gut. Do you think they're going to have different charges? Because they, they, you see, they, they are connected to each other. So they will uh, rearrange themselves, right? Because they are minus here, plus here. So if you have one, two, three, four, five, six plus, you need to have six minus. Does it make sense? Right? So if you have the same, same, uh, uh, so you have that type of connection, what's going to happen is that Q, you're going to have Q there. They're going to have the same Q. So that will be minus Q, that's going to be Q, and that's going to be Q, and that's going to be minus Q. So in series, okay, they have the same Q. Q1 equals Q2 equals Q, because you see they will rearrange themselves. They are close to each other. So if you have a minus Q one in one place here, you need to have a plus Q in the other place, but they don't have the same C1 and they don't have the same V1. Is that clear? It makes sense, right? And uh, it's not the same as in parallel. Consequence, consequence is that you can still do what they do in electronics all the time. You know, you can simplify and say, okay, everything happens like I have a single capacitor okay, with Q. And C equivalent, so the voltage here will be 1.5 volt. And we are not going to worry about that now. We will worry for the next uh, chapter. But we can show that because nature likes symmetry. So if it, with a parallel configuration, you increase the capacitance, Guess what's going to happen if you have them in series? You're going to decrease, right? So one is increasing, the other one is decreasing. So you're going to decrease it. So the equation, you can work it out. It's in your book, but we are not going to worry about it. The equation is this. So you are decreasing the capacitance. The Q here uh, and, and then here you're going to have 1.5 volt, right? We're going to... I had problem here. I'm going to keep those problems for uh, next chapter. Right. Okay, so the Q here will be the same as what you started with because remember when you put that in a black box here, yeah, from the point of view of the outside world, you don't want to have something different okay, from the outside world. So that means that if you put an equivalent um, Capacitor, you're going to have Q here and minus Q. So the Q will be the same. When they are in parallel, remember, we did Q1 plus Q2. Is that clear? So you 
I'm not going to demonstrate that when I mean, it's just algebra, you can go on your book. But the most important thing to understand is that when they are in parallel, when they are in parallel, you can replace by one, and the charge on that one will be Q1 plus Q2. Okay, because it's the same thing like if you are doing electronics. I love electronics, okay, that's my favorite topic. Too bad I cannot teach it anymore. But you remember here you have Q1, here you have Q2. You want to have that thing here replaced by a single one. So from the outside world, here you're going to have Q1 plus Q2. And from the outside world, you have minus Q, I mean, minus Q1 plus Q2 here from the outside world. So it makes sense that you can replace it by one single one, and then you have Q1 plus Q2, and the capacitance will be C1 plus C2. You can show that, right? And that will be your 1.5 volt. Whereas here, first of all, you have Q here, and you have minus Q. You see that from the outside world, you need to, ke to keep that Q and that minus Q. So you can replace that by a single one with a Q here, a minus Q here. You have 1.5 volt. And the only way to achieve that is to have a capacitor equivalent using that equation. And 1.5. Here the voltage drop was V1. And here the voltage drop was V2. Okay, is that clear? So, uh, I don't know, there was a uh, from your book. Hmm, maybe I will do on the pop quiz, I don't know. Questions so far? So, I, I highly, okay, this is, okay, what I did in the share folder. I hope you use the share folder. I mean, you do whatever you want, you know. But it's, I, I advise you to use the, so you have the PDF lecture. Here you have videos for the assignment. So assignment seven, I just did it, and you have videos inside. And here I have share with you an app. And it's, uh, it's, it's you are not going to find the same online. Because what happened is that they used Flash before. And for some mysterious reason that doesn't make sense to me, they decided to phase out Flash. So we lost all those great, great uh, simulation that were developed in Java and then put that inside your browser using Flash. But they phased out Flash. So they are trying to turn all those great simulations into HTML5, but they were not able to keep all the great features. So I saved the original here for you. It's in Java. So what you need to have is Java in your uh, computer. It's free. You can download Java. I'm sure since you are all engineer, you know you know how to do it. And then you can run that app, especially if you are using electronics. And, and then you can use it for the homework, okay? Because you will have only one attempt on the homework, so it's a good idea if you do that. Is that clear? It's free. You can download it, or you can go to the library and download it in the library if you don't have a desktop. Okay. So that's how it works. OK, great. OK, so we move to the next chapter. Any question? I don't know what's happening. Is that, is that, uh, that something happening in Miami that like three, four for the class is not here today? Is that the, there is a board show, right? I heard. I don't know. Nothing special? Do you have exam? No? 
Even your brother is not here. Is that Ismail who is not here? You are Ismail? Ayman is not here. Remember, I have the attendance here. Remember, I boost grades if you are attendance. Oh, it's just on time. Right? Make sure you catch up the beginning because I talked about the pop quiz next week. Okay, so the best part of uh, physics 2, of course, is electric circuit. I cannot uh, be uh, competing with your electric circuit class, <laughs> so I'm going to skim through, but I think this is the best part of physics 2. So, for example, here you see capacitors. Uh, this is an um, oscillator, so that will give you the time. So it's like um, give you the frequency, like gigahertz or megahertz. This is an inductor that you have here. More capacitors, some uh, chips, and uh, this this will be resistors. So uh, the best. Okay, so every time you have an electric circuit, the most important components are, of course, the power supply that will provide the circuit with a voltage, with energy. And remember the definition of voltage. So in this chapter, we're going to think of voltage like energy per one coulomb. Okay? So for example, if you have 120 volt from the power outlet, that means that every coulomb of charge is bumped up to an energy of 120 joule. The other way to look at voltage, which will be very helpful when we're going to solve circuit, is to think of voltage like a height. You start up 120 joule, you start here, and then, and then the other side here will be the ground, so from 120 to the ground, you're going to drop voltage, like you are dropping height across loads. And the loads are the components that are going to consume energy. So that's the best way to understand how a circuit works. So the best way to solve a circuit is to uh, do it the engineer way. That means when you represent circuit, I like to do it like this way. You have the power supply. Let's say you have 12 volt, and then you're going to have the load. Okay, so you're going to have, maybe you have load one. So that will be a resistor here. We represent the load like this. Maybe you're going to have two load here that will be in parallel. And then you have another load here. And I like, at the end, I like to have my ground here. If you do it this way, it's much easier to understand what's going on because here you have current. Current will be like water flowing down to the ground. So your voltage is like a pump, right? You are bringing water to a higher level of energy. It has potential energy. And then that water is going to flow and then burp out energy into the load, the load are going to consume that energy. So you can think of that like water flowing. <coughs> so here you have I, that will be the current flowing, and then maybe you have I1 here, I2, it's very much like pipes, and then they combine back together and they go back to ground. By the way, that's how here it's working, right? The return path is the ground, it's connected to the ground. So it's easier to think like this. So how we will define the current, I'm going to go into more detail, but it's, uh, so voltage will be the energy per coulomb, and the current, it's easy to understand it if you think of that as the number of coulomb per second, okay? So I'm going to go back to that, but imagine those little sphere, you know, flowing. I'm going to show you an app. Of course, it's not true because it's electrons flowing, but it's easier to understand. I mean, it's easier to think of currents are 
is being made of one Coulomb of charge flowing. So I'm showing you a, an app and it will be easier to understand. So I'm just introducing it and then we'll get back to that. So of course you need the power supply. The power supply will provide what we call the EMF. Okay, EMF it's for historical reason, but you always have some chemical reaction maybe or some kind of other physical process in which you have electric energy being provided. So those power supply, what they do, they take one Coulomb of charge, so imagine like one in my hand, one Coulomb of charge, and doing work on it, and then that Coulomb of charge is given some energy, right, that we call the voltage. So in the case of a battery, so you have two terminals inside the nitric acid, I think, or I think it's nitric acid. So anyway, you have some chemical reaction. This chemical reaction is doing work on each Coulomb of charge that will boost it to a higher level of energy that we call potential energy. So that's how it works. Okay? You have different kinds of uh, power supply. You can use batteries, so in that case, you are using chemical energy. It has to come from somewhere, right? You have generator, of course, for electricity that we are using here. Uh, you can use the sun, photoelectric effect. You can use fuse cells with uh, hydrogen. You can use uh, two, two metals at different temperatures. will also provide some voltage. You can use pressure, like, you know, in the old watches, the wrist watch with quartz. If, if you change, the, if you squeeze crystal, it will provide voltage, right? So you have different ways to do it. That was my best experiment. You know, it's very cool to do. And in that case, same thing. You have two conductors, some electrolyte in between. Each uh, lemon... Maybe it's going to provide like one volt or something like this. So here they are in series. So now you have four volts and you can lit an LED. So LED does not need that much of current, but it needs at least 1.7 volt to work. Otherwise, it doesn't lit. Okay, so just an introduction. So what's the main idea? The main idea is that work has to be done to lift the potential energy for each Coulomb of charge. So imagine here you have one Coulomb of charge, work has to be done, then it has potential energy, so 1.5 volt in that case, so 1.5 joule per Coulomb, and that energy can be burped out into the load that will turn that energy into something. So here it would be heat and light, and then it go back, has no more energy, it's gonna be boosted again. So that's one way to think of that. So if you have 1.5 volts, so 1.5 joule per coulomb. So what can I do to increase the energy available per second? What can be changed here? So you just do one Coulomb of charge, or maybe we can burp out more than one. So if you burp out three Coulomb of charge, how much energy are you going to have? So three times what? Each Coulomb of charge is 1.5. 4.5 Joule, let's say per second, right? But maybe it's not enough. What if I burp out 10 of them in one second? And each charge of one Coulomb is 1.5. What if I burp out 10 of them? How many joules will be available? 15 joules per second. 15 joules per second. And what is that? What is joule per second? The, uh, so the number of charge per second will be the current, but what's the unit of joule per second? What? You said what? What, yeah? What? Joule per second is 
what and what is what it's the unit for power or, or work per second right so the energy per second provided by your power supply or consumed by the load is just gonna be and we're gonna see that voltage times current okay because voltage it's gonna be energy for one coulomb so for one charge and the current is the number of charge or the number of coulombs per second so we're going to see that it's just an introduction unit for voltage is the volt unit for current is the amps coulomb per second is the amps so what does it mean it means that if i have one coulomb per second i'm going to provide 1.5 joule per second if i have two coulombs per second i'm going to have three joule per second so not only I can change the voltage, but of course, how many of those coulombs I'm going to burp out or the power supply will burp out per second. So you have voltage and current. So uh, just for you to um, visualize, and, I, I, and again, I think that understanding the concept is very important because the rest is just boring math so when you have a circuit you're gonna have of course you're gonna have your power supply okay of course you're gonna have a load of course electricity cannot flow in the air unless you are breaking down the electric field of course you need some connecting wire that have to be a conductor if you want to be fancy you put some uh, switch you throw a switch in there you connect everything together ah you have to close the switch and now it's flowing so imagine those little sphere imagine they are each of them are one coulomb of charge one coulomb of charge, each one of them. Now, if I take the, um, I can measure the current here. Can you see here? It says 0 0.3 amps. So what's the meaning of the current? It will be the number of charges crossing or going through here per second so here i have 0 0.3 coulombs per second going through each of these little coulombs that's that's why you can imagine it oh, it's nine volt okay so that means each coulomb has an energy of nine joule and then nine joule per coulomb and I have 0 0.3 per second, so that will be 9 times 0 0.3. It, it's about uh, 3, 3 watt delivered to the load. The load, you know, use that energy to turn into light and heat. And then those little one coulomb of charge go back. They don't have energy anymore, and then they get boosted again. Okay? In reality, this is not what's happening. In reality, these are electrons really flowing from minus to plus. And we discussed that, that each electron, for example, from here, we have an energy of 120 electron volt, but it's easier to understand. Now, if I increase the voltage, it's, it's like uh, increasing the pressure. You see, I increase the voltage. Now I have more current. How much current do I have? Five, like about six amps. So six coulomb of charge going through every second 
each charge has an energy of 58 joule. That's how much energy is being provided to the load. Do you see how, how it works? So it's worth it to play with it, you know, to because uh, otherwise it becomes very boring physics if you, if you are not doing experiment. Physics without experiment is useless. You really have to do the experiment to understand what's going on. And of course, I can measure the voltage here. Yeah, I want you to understand one thing is that when you are measuring voltage, it's like you are taking a meter tape and you are measuring height. You're measuring height. So you come from outside, you don't touch your circuit, your circuit is working, you are measuring height. When you are measuring current, you have to go in and start to count how many charges are going through. So measuring current is not the same thing. Okay, I'm not teaching labs, so I'm not going to go more into details, but that's the idea. Okay. And then another element is interesting, and that will be called the resistor. The goal of the resistor will be to limit the amount of current. So it will be like a faucet. So when you put a resistor in a circuit, it's like you are taking those pipes where the, thing, the, the current is flowing and squeeze the pipe everywhere. So not only where you are placing the resistor here, but you are squeezing it everywhere. And uh, there is so much resistor now that it doesn't work or something like this. Okay, it's still working. So if I change the resistance, <coughs> you see I can increase the resistance and I'm slowing down the charges flowing. So I want you to imagine that the resistor, what it does is to decrease the size of the pipes everywhere. So you slow down the charges which means you are decreasing the current because every second you're going to have less current flowing through that section or this section. So it will be always the same. Is that clear? Okay, so that component is called the resistance. The other thing you have to understand is that any load, so it depends on the load, but a load like this, so it's not working anymore. Okay, I'm frozen. But a load like this has its own resistance. So it's like it's, it's uh, um, it, it puts a resistance in, inside the circuit, right? So any load will have a resistance. Most of the load will have a resistance. So by putting a load, you uh, decrease the current. But I don't know, it's very annoying. I don't know why I'm frozen now. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I just wanted to show you one more thing. You know, I don't want to take too much time because we need to, to move. One more thing. So I have my power supply. And, okay, I'll just connect quickly. This is my load. Uh, connect that together. Even the wire will have some resistance. And you see that if I click here, I have a resistance, right? Well, that's how we have 40 watts versus 100 watts. 100 watt light bulb, we have less resistance than a 40 watt light bulb, which means that it will let more current flow if you have a 100 watt light bulb. Now, if I remove the resistance, what do you think is going to happen? Very, very bright, and even we have a short, right? Well, that's what we get. We have a short, okay? So don't do that. So that means that the, the current always takes the path of least resistance if you give it the choice. So, for example, 
if there is a leakage somewhere, like if, if this is open, connect to the hot wire and I touch it, do you think electricity is going to go bother or no? I'm, I'm, we're going to be nice. We're going to skip that. Go here, ta ta ta, into the laptop and back to the ground. No, 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 no. It's going to find a shortcut through me. Okay? And it's going to go through me to the ground because it's a shortcut. So if I touch it with my right hand, I have chance to survive because it will go on that side. And last time I checked, my heart is on the left side. Of course, it's more dangerous to touch with your left hand because you go for your heart. The heart is a muscle. It responds to electricity. It's going to contract. Um, although some people have survived electrocution. But so don't do that, OK? Any questions so far? It's a lot of concept, but it can save your life, isn't it? So electric current, we pretend that electric current is the flow of one coulomb of charge, right? The number of charge per second is called the current, and the unit is one is ampere. So amp, you say amp when you want to. Uh, show that you know your stuff, you don't say ampere, you say amp, right? And that will be the notation. It just means coulomb per second, named after Charles Henri Ampere. Go French. And of course, it's not what's happening in reality, you know, but um, it's, it's because of, of Benjamin Franklin, had 50% to get it right, 50% to get it wrong. So he understood that you had two kinds of charge, plus and minus. And he thought that it was the plus that can move and the minus that they cannot move. And he, he got it wrong, of course. Not of course, but he had 50% chance. It's actually the electrons flowing. It's not the plus flowing. Okay, because the pluses are the nucleus the nuclei and the nuclei cannot cannot move. So when you apply a voltage to any kind of conductor, and it has to be a conductor, you're going to apply an electric field, the voltage. You know, if you have voltage, you have an electric field. This electric field is going to pull on the electrons, right? So electrons are going to move opposite direction in the opposite direction, right? So everything happens, it's pluses moving. So it connects to what we have learned. Each time you have an electric field, the electric field can push or pull on charges. So inside a simple electric circuit, the, the things that are moving are electrons. Is that clear? So that's the definition of current, it's the number of coulomb per second. So if you have your circuit, and let's say there is a surface here, if you have three coulombs per second, that will be three amp. If you have 10 coulombs per second, that will be 10 amp. If you have just one, that will be one amp. Is that clear? Right? So that's the definition. And then you have two types of current. You have direct current, like in a toy, for example, or in my laptop, I have direct current. Or you have alternating current, or AC. So that's what we get from here. You see, I have a charger. To my charger, I have AC. So that means the current go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, 60 times a second. That will be the frequency. And then it go through that box here. AC will turn into DC because my laptop doesn't like AC, it likes DC. In addition to that, it's going to bring down the voltage, which is 120 volt to 20 volt. Because if I connect that directly to the outlet, I'm, I'm going to fry my laptop and me too, maybe. So 20 volt on the, the side of my laptop means 20 joule per coulomb and 
and I'm going to have, it says here, I don't know how many currents, how much current do I have, I don't know. Usually it's like 2 to 3 amp coming out. So AC on one side, DC on the other side. It's very cool to do that in lab. The way you do it, you have to use um, what is called diode bridge. It's very interesting. Uh, so anyway, so electricity or current flowing, you know, you always have an electric field that's going to push or pull. Now, electricity or current flowing, flowing usually it's made of electrons in, in this kind of circuit, but it could be also made of ions or electrolytes, right? That's how electricity flow in the human body. That's why we need electrolytes. In plasma, so you have four states of matter. So you have a solid, a liquid, gas, and plasma. Plasma, it's when the electrons are not bound anymore to their nuclei. They are free to move. So you have plasma, for example, in the sun. See? Plasma flowing. Uh, then you have in semiconductor, it could be holes or electrons flowing. Super interesting, but I'm not going to go into details. Semiconductors uh, like silicon, germanium, that's what make up all the chips that we have in our electronics. So we have holes that are charged uh, carrier or electrons. So anyway, that's just a parenthesis. Just to give you an idea of the current in everyday life, in the light bulb, you have one amp. In your wristwatch, you're going to have one microamp. In, in your body, see, nervous system use electricity all the time. Pico, one picoamp, right? That will be, okay, so anything that has a motor inside could be a conceptual question, okay? Anything that you use, like any tool, and then you have a motor that spin, you need a lot of current. Those devices are, have a very great appetite for current to apply a torque, to make something move, okay? And that will involve magnetism. Uh, you need to have a high current, so 25 amps for that drill. Uh, that big house, 100 amps, 1,000 amps on the high tension uh, wires, two milliamps in your phone, okay? Just to give you an idea. So that will be all the equation we have so far on physical quantity. Times has to be in second. Energy in joules. Q is the amount of charge. That will be in coulombs, okay? I is the number of coulombs per second, okay? So it's Q divided by T, coulombs per second. And the unit is amps. You have voltage. Voltage is a property of two points. So for circuit, it's good to have the second point at ground. It's easier to understand. That will be energy per coulomb. Unit is volt. Power consumed or power produced. Okay? So it will be the voltage times the current. Why? Because voltage is energy per coulomb. Current is coulomb per second. If you cross out the coulomb, you are left with energy per second. Is that clear? Makes sense here in my computer. I have two amps. What does it mean? Two amps means two joules per second. So if I go inside and I count, one, two, one second. Okay? So two amp, that means two coulomb per second. Each coulomb has 20 joule because this is 20 volt so 2 times 20 is 40 so 40 joule per second that will be the power okay and you have all those equations so why, why don't you do this after four min 40 minutes of teaching people start to space out and look at your phone and okay so don't space out and, and help each other. 
try to do this one. Remember to convert, we have a pop quiz at the end. And, and next uh, Tuesday pop quiz will be uh, uh, from the beginning of the lecture. If, uh, if I remember. You have two ways to do it. You can use the equation or you can just make sense of it, okay? So here you have the current, so 0 0.17, 10 to the negative 3 coulombs per second. So every second, there is that much of coulombs flowing. And what's the meaning of 3 volt? That means 3 joule for 1 coulomb. So if you make sense of this by looking at the unit, that's a secret, right? When you are doing science, when you are doing math, or especially science, biology, chemistry, you know, whatever engineering you're doing, look at the unit. And don't look at the shortcut, like don't look at amps, of course, not going to teach you anything, but look look at the, at the base here, coulomb per second. So in one hour is 3,600 seconds, right? So in one second, you have 0 0.17, what? Coulomb. So in 6602 coulomb right just make sense of it if you go back to the meaning so you see per second one hour 3600 so how much energy delivered delivered in one hour but i already know that the number of charge is 0 0.612 coulomb and i have the voltage the voltage tells me that it's going to be 3 joule for 1 coulomb so it's just a proportion. Does that make sense? Huh? 1.83? What's your name? Dimitri. 1.83 joules delivered by the power supply consumed by the load one is delivering and one is consuming so uh, we, we can we can show that as this so you have three volt and we're gonna we like to represent the load by by your resistor R, so that will be your load. And you have current flowing. So if we were to, to, to put a sensor here, I, so we put a sensor to find the current, we see how many coulombs is going to cross through here, it's going to go through. That will be 0 0.617 milliamp. And if we place here what we call the voltmeter to measure the voltage, it's going to be 3 volt. So current goes from plus, ta -ta 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 -ta, going through here, getting a boost. So now it's at 0, and then shoom, go back to 3, 
boost, get a boost of energy, and then go down again. It's like it's like a, a pump, right? You increase the potential energy. That potential energy is used to load the load, could be kinetic energy, for example, and then you get up again. That's how you want to think of it. Okay? So once you understand the concept, you know it's not that hard. Okay, and then we have something called electric resistance and Ohm's law. So, you know, in physics, you have nature's law, law that are, will be true everywhere, at least in our universe, right? You go to another universe, maybe they have different laws, but in our universe, F equals MA will work everywhere for everything. Now, Ohm's law doesn't work for everything. It, it's just something experimental. It will only work from some loads and some components, okay? So imagine you have a circuit, so you can think of that like water flowing. You see that if you decrease the size of the pipes, you're going to have less water flowing. So we, we have something called the resistance. And, uh, okay, let, let me show you. Here, for example, she, she takes like a mass, has a mass M, increase the potential energy, like a battery increases the potential energy. That potential energy is going to go into kinetic energy. So you have an electric field, take it down to a lower potential energy. If it, if it is a one coulomb of charge, the same way you have gravity taking the mass going down. And what do you think is going to happen if I increase those pegs here? I yeah, put more, more of them. So you have more resistance. It's going to move slower, right? So in the circuit, we have the same thing. Each time you're going to put a load, you are increasing the resistance of the circuit. That means you are going to, for the same voltage, increasing the resistance is going to make it go slower. So you're going to decrease the current. More, for the same voltage, for the same height, if you increase the resistance in the circuit, you're going to decrease the current. That's Ohm's law. If you multiply the voltage by 2, the current is going to be divided by 2. Uh, what, what did I say? I, I, I just forgot what I say. So no, for the same voltage, if you increase the resistance, you're going to decrease the current, right? So if you multiply the resistance by two, the current is going to be divided by two. Is that clear? So let me show you the app again. Uh, so I, I'm not sure if, if it's going to record because... That takes a lot of CPU, and my CPU is very weak, so I hope it's not freezing. I'm, it doesn't matter. Like, any load will uh, be like a resistor. So I'm going to take my resistor here, and I'm going to connect everything together. So I'm, I'm not going to change the voltage. You know, the voltage is 9 volt. However, I can change the resistance of the resistor. So you, you, you see how fast those charges are flowing? So you have to think of current like the speed, you know, how fast they are flowing, how many of them in one second. What's going to happen if I increase the resistance, you know? It's, it's going to slow them down. So they're going to flow, but at a slower rate. So the rate at which the coulombs are flowing is less. It means that in one second, I'm going to have less energy delivered to the load. So in that case, the load is just a resistance, a resistor, and, and that means the energy will be turned into heat. 
So when you, you buy those very cheap heater for the, your dorms, where sometimes in Florida it can get cold, right? It's just a huge resistor inside that turn energy into heat. That's how heater works. So a toaster, when you have a toaster for French toast, for example, uh, it's, it's just a resistor and energy is turned into heat. So if I decrease the resistor, what's going to happen? It's going to flow faster. Okay, is that clear? And and it's easier to see once we. Uh, I'm I'm going to take a, a number. It's going to be easier once we practice. I don't know. I I want to take five. Okay, can I take five? No, I want to take five. Can I take five, please? No. Just five. Okay, five. So five ohms, and we're going to see that next, but the unit for resistance is ohms. Nine volt. And let's measure the current. Okay, what do you see here? 1.8. Right? So what do you think the voltage is across the resistor? If you have 9 volt, and that 9 volt is not being shared by anything else but just one resistor. So what do you think is going to be the voltage? 9. So it makes sense, right? Okay, you have height is 9. Drop across one load. Okay, so the voltage, and that's very important, the voltage across... The resistor is 9 volt. The current going through the resistor is 1.80 amps. And the resistance is 5 ohms. Can you find some kind of relationship between the voltage across the resistor, the current through the resistor, and the resistance. Yeah. Yeah, so if you do volt, which is 9, you divide by 1.80, then you get 5. And that will be true for any load that will behave like a resistor, right? That, that will turn some of the energy into heat. This is called Ohm's law. And you, you should look up at Ohm's because he has a wonderful, wonderful story. Because um, he was not part of the elite. I think he started like a high school teacher, so people didn't believe him, did, didn't give him credit to begin with. He, had, he was shamed. He had to quit his job. In, <laughs> that's, that's something that we don't see today but um, and then he had to take another job that was not very uh, prestigious and then it took a very long time that some people started to support him and say okay he's right there is such law so this is called Ohm's law a name after George Ohm so it says that the voltage, so if you put a voltmeter here, across, it has to be across, okay, typical mistake, will be the resistor times the current going through. So the current has to go through. So each time you have a load with a resistance R, you are measuring the voltage across it, and you are measuring the current going through, then you have what is called Ohm's law. Is that clear? It's what we call an experimental law. It's not a nature's law. Because when you're going to work with semiconductor, or when you're going to work so with uh, chips, for example, op-amp, are you working with LED or diode? 
that's not going to be true. They don't obey Ohm's law. So that's only for some loads. Loads are things that are consuming energy. Are you with me? Are you still with me? Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, for example, I can put a resistor in my circuit to decrease the current because I don't want too much current. So don't think it's going to squeeze here just at that spot here. Everything happens like everything is squeezed. So I'm limiting the current everywhere in the circuit. And uh, you can see that. I should have show you that, that if I increase the resistance, everywhere it's being slowed down, okay? It's moving slow everywhere. So it's just conceptual, and then we'd, we're going to do more math. But the other thing I want you to understand is that if I put another load, like let's say this one, and let's let's put some social distance between them. So do you have the amps? So do you think I'm going to measure 9 volt here? So now I have 3.25 volt across that resistor. But I started with 9. So I'm dropping 3.25 volt across this one. So what do you think it's going to be here across that resistor? Very good. Okay, so it will be 9 minus... 3.25, right? So if I measure here, will be 5.7, because 5.7 plus 3.25, whatever, add up to 9 volts. Does that make sense? So you are falling across each load, such as when it adds up to 9 volts. And of course, you can uh, use Ohm's law still, so it means that the voltage, which is 5.745, and you divide by the current, so you do 5.745 divided by 0 0.33, you're going to get 17.65. Do you understand? So the voltage across the load equals resistance times current going through. This is called Ohm's law. Is that clear? Now, if I measure the voltage here, and I, I can have the resistance, so show resistance is 10. So can you tell me, how much is 10 times 0 0.33? Um, 3.3. 3.3. And 3.3 is the voltage. Isn't that amazing? You see that? Yeah, right? So voltage equals Ri. Okay? So I, I know it's a lot of concept, but not everyone is taking a circuit, so... At least I hope I hope it's clear. So then next time we can go faster and move. Oh, by the way, you, you have to take.